Hey, what's up guys? It's Austin here from Rohinus Python, and in today's video, I'm going to touch up on co-dominant and dominant projects, how they work, and how they interact with each other. Before we get into all that cool stuff, huge shout out to American Made Balls. Thank you, Ron, for this really cool shirt. You actually gave me three shirts, which is amazing. I wasn't expecting three, only one, but three shirts is crazy, and he's definitely not slacking on the back. So go give him a follow on Instagram and YouTube, American Made Balls. And so this video is gonna be about co-dominant and dominant projects. There is the recessive projects, but I don't wanna touch up on that yet. We'll do that in the future. So another video, so stay tuned for that. But let's get right into this co-dominant and dominant video. So we'll first start off with incomplete dominant or just a dominant morph. And these are your champagnes, your spiders, your pinstripe and a few others, and if you guys want to figure out what those are, I'll leave a link down below to World of Ball Pythons where it gives a little bit more of a description of what they are and how many different genes there are in each. And uh, you even go and use the World of Ball Python calculator for stuff that I'm going to tell you later in this video. But basically, if you were to go and breed an incomplete dominant to an incomplete dominant, all you can get are the incomplete dominant and normals. So there's no super form of this gene. In contrary, co-dominant, like pastel, if I were to breed a pastel to a pastel, I will get normals, pastels, and super pastels. And that's the difference between an incomplete dominant and a co-dominant. So a co-dominant can have a super form, an incomplete dominant does not possess a super form. So, and we'll get into supers a little bit more in the future, but we'll just stick on to the incomplete dominant for now. And I'll go and show you one right now and we'll talk about it. So if you were to breed this spider to another spider, you would get 25% of the babies being normal and 75% of the babies being spider, which completes 100% of the odds that you can produce. Just because the odds are 25% and 75%, that doesn't mean that you are gonna get exactly what the odds are. They are odds, doesn't mean they're for certain. So you can definitely go and kill the odds and get 100% spiders or nine out of 10 being spiders, or you could do the total opposite and get one out of 10 being spiders. It's just a game of odds, so it does not mean this is for sure what you're going to get. It's the odds of what is going to be inside of each egg. Now that I gave you a little bit of an example of what an incomplete dominant morph does, I'll tell you what a co-dominant morph does. And a co-dominant morph is pretty much all the morphs, other than the few that I just listed before, that are non-recessive. And so basically that is your pastels, banana, fire, mojave, lesser, and so on and so on. And if you want to figure out more, go check that link down in the description once again, World of Ball Pythons, and you can go and see which morphs are incomplete dominant, co-dominant, and recessive. And we're going to touch up on the recessive ones in another video, but let's just stay to the co-dominant ones for right now. So basically, co-dominant works that if I were to breed one to another, I can get normals, the gene, and a super form. And a super form is really great because if I were to breed a super form to a normal, everything will be coming out as the single gene or the single form of that super. So basically, inside a ball python, there are two alleles that the gene can rest on. And basically, if I were to breed a pastel to a pastel, you can get something called a super pastel, where you have pastel on both alleles. But normal pastel only has a pastel on one of the alleles. So one of the alleles is vacant, and the other one has the pastel morph. There are other things that tie into this, like allelic, and act like supers, but I'll make another video in the future about that, so do not worry about that yet. This is just a very basic understanding of what co-dominant and incomplete dominant morphs do. So, now I'm going to go show you with some snakes, just so you can get a little bit of a better understanding. Right here, I have a yellow belly, and if you were to breed a yellow belly to a normal, it would work very similar to how the incomplete dominant does. So, 50% of the babies will be coming out normal, and the other half of the babies will be coming out as yellow belly. But something really different happens when you decide to breed a yellow belly to another yellow belly. And when you breed a yellow belly to a yellow belly, 25% of the babies will come out normal, 50% of the babies will come out as yellow bellies, and then the other 25% of the babies will come out as super yellow bellies, but as ball pythons we call them ivories. So if you breed a yellow belly to a yellow belly, you have a 1 in 4 chance of hitting a normal, a 2 in 4 chance of hitting a yellow belly, and a 1 in 4 chance of hitting a super yellow belly, which in this case would be an ivory. So the really cool thing about an ivory is, if you were to breed an ivory 
to a normal, like so, all of the babies will come out as a yellow belly. So it's really cool to have a super in your collection. It's very powerful. It takes the guessing out of IDing. So yellow belly is one of those morphs that can be hard to ID. So if you do want to go and take the guessing out of the equation, you get yourself an ivory and ivory combo male or female and breed that every single baby will at least have the yellow belly inside of it. So it's really cool and very important to have supers in your collection because it does help progress your genes and get that many more genes into your offspring. So like I touched up on before, ball pythons have two alleles in which genes are expressed on and an incomplete dominant morph can only be expressed on one of the alleles. This, this is why there is no super form, but a co-dominant morph can be expressed on both alleles which would be the super form. And it can also be expressed on one allele, which would be the single form of that morph. Just like the yellow belly is only on one, but the ivory is on both, which is a super yellow belly. And the cool thing about super is, like I already said, if I were to breed a super, that gene will be expressed in every baby because it's passed on through both alleles. When the gene is only passed on through one allele, half of the babies, just like the incomplete dominant, should be that morph or just like the single form of a co-dominant morph, yellow belly, if I were to breed a yellow belly to a normal, half of the baby should be normal and the other half should be yellow belly. But these are odds and they're not 100% all the time and sometimes you get good odds, sometimes you get bad odds, and it usually balances out. And it's not the odds for the whole clutch, it's the odds of each egg. So if I have three eggs, let's say I have a yellow belly to a normal, all three of those eggs could be yellow belly because the odds of hitting one yellow belly in each egg is 50%. Sometimes you're gonna get good odds like I just said and sometimes you're gonna get bad odds and get all normals. It's the way that the world works. So basically I'm gonna go and show you how different genes can come together and make different morphs. Because just like I said how the morphs reside on alleles, not every morph resides on the same allele. And there are some that do reside in the same allele, which is called allelic or act like super. But we're not going to get into the, that into this video because it is very confusing. And I just want to give you guys the very basics of co-dominant and incomplete dominant morphs. Just to give you a quick example on how genes can come together to make certain combos. Here we have a spider ball python on the left and on the right we have a banana ball python. The spider is an incomplete dominant and the banana is a co-dominant but the banana is in its single form so it's not going to produce all bananas. So if we were to breed them together a quarter of the baby should be coming out as spider, a quarter of the baby should be coming out as bananas, another quarter of the babies will be coming out as normals and then the last quarter will be coming out as banana spiders and basically so a quarter of your odds are going to be one of the parents another quarter is going to be the other parents another quarter is going to be a normal and then the last quarter is going to be a combination of the genetics of the parents and when you do add more genes into it it does get more complex and there's a simple equation on how to figure out what your odds are and that's using a Punnett square. And I'm gonna to touch up on that really soon right now, but we're just gonna use this visual representation right now to go and show you what you can make. And when you do put more genes into it, it gets super complex. You can have a three gene to a four gene or a five gene to a five gene, and the possibilities are almost endless and the odds are astronomical. The same odds of hitting a normal would be the same odds of hitting a six or seven gene ball python, which might sound a little bit funny, but that's just the way it works. And for stuff like that, I highly recommend you guys going on World of Ball Pythons or Morph, Morph Market and using the calculator there to go determine what odds you have of hitting each ball python. And right now we're just going to go take a really quick look at Punnett squares. I'm going to draw one out for you and we're just going to do a simple equation on one of them. So right here I drew out a Punnett square for you guys. Sorry for the messy handwriting, I'm not the best writer or the best artist. So it might not be as proportionate as it should be but you still get the idea. So here's how you spell Punnett square if you guys want to go and look up more information on this and go and learn more. This is just simple biology. A lot of you probably learned this inside of high school if you took biology or some of you probably didn't take biology and just learning it right now. But there's a bunch of videos online you can go and watch to go learn more about Punnett squares. And a really good thing to do while you're writing a Punnett square is to draw a legend. And right here, I like to express every gene with an X and then the letter of the gene starting. So XS is spider, XB is banana, and then XX would be a normal, and then SB would be a banana spider. 
So now we're going to draw both of the parents on here. So we have XS for the spider, XB for banana. And then you're going to take these last two places right down here and draw each letter individually. So XS, and then we have XB up here. And then all you got to do is drop the letters down where they're supposed to be. So X is going to go here, and it's going to go here. And then this X is going to go here, and it's going to drop down here. B is going to drop down here and down here. And then the S is going to drop over here. And the other S is going to drop right there. And that gives us the whole odds of what we're going to make here. So 1 and 4 are going to be XX. And XX is a normal. 1 and 4 are going to be a XB. And a XB is a banana. The other 1 and 4 is going to be SX or XS, which is a spider. And then the last quarter, it's kind of hard to do with only one hand. I really wish Elias was here to be my cameraman. But the last quarter is going to be a SB, which is a banana spider. And that completes the whole odds of what you're going to make. When you have other genes into it, it gets a lot more messier, a lot bigger of a headache. That's why World of All Pythons is a great place to go and use the genetic calculator to go and see a visual representation of what the odds are because sometimes it's not 1 in 4, it's 1 in 16, 1 in 32, 1 in 64, 1 in 128, and so on and so on. And those odds are astronomical and your Punnett squares will be looking a lot more complex than this right here. This is a very basic Punnett square of when I'm at, trying to do two different morphs together. If I were to only do one morph, it'd be an XS to a XX, which would be a normal, and you would get something similar to this, but pertaining to the genetics that you are breeding. And that's pretty much all I want to show you guys on pun squares. I don't want to confuse you guys too much because it can be super confusing, especially if this is your first time looking at one. So I highly recommend you guys to go and look up some other YouTube videos on pun squares and basic biology so you can get a better understanding of the odds when breeding. So I hope I didn't confuse you guys too much with talking about the Punnett squares, incomplete dominant and co-dominant morphs. It's a lot to grasp at once, but I'm sure if you guys watch this video a few times and even watch some other videos YouTubers have made on this, this topic, you'll get a really good understanding of it. World of All Pythons calculator and Morph Market calculator are great tools for a better understanding of this if you do not want to go and waste your time, or it's not really wasting your time if you don't want to go and draw out those Punnett squares. Punnett squares are a really crucial part of this, I believe, because I learned Punnett squares in high school and as soon as I started breeding ball pythons, it was very easy for me to understand what was going on and I actually do Punnett squares in my head and I'm actually able to go and do some of the odds up here instead of having to go every time to World of Ball Pythons or Morph Market Calculator, which is a really good tool to help you with those really quick odds that you want to figure out when you're pairing or making the pairings that you want to do for your breeding season. So I hope you guys got a really good understanding of it. If you guys need any more help, I will do a video in the future, an updated, for anything I might have missed. So go and comment below anything you think I've missed or anything you didn't understand where I can explain it better in the future. And I will definitely go and do that. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace out.